So I switch to English. I say hi to Massimo. Hi, Massimo, how are you? Connecting to Italy. We are trying to connect to Italy. In the meantime, the Massimo is uh, connected. I'm going to introduce him. Massimo is, uh, I would say, is an old friend. Um, we met five or six years ago. I think Massimo was in, uh, in Perugia, a small uh, Italian city, where Massimo was uh, giving an amazing presentation. And he showed a couple of cases with Mucoderm. And since then, so we started working together on basically two different levels. One clinical research uh, level, and Massimo is doing a lot of research with uh, together with us, and on a more educational level to do events like this. Uh, so we traveled together, Latin America, Europe. So I would say we became friends. So um, I will introduce you Massimo with a couple of words. Massimo has a private practice in uh, Firenze, a beautiful city in Italy. And um, he uh, works as a visiting professor at University of Genova, Italy. He's an ITI fellow and is also the uh, director of the ITI study club in Florence. So he's going to talk about new possibilities in hard and soft tissue man management around dental implants. So Massimo, uh, thank you for being here and the digital stage is yours. Thank you very much, Arturo. Uh, it's a great pleasure. It's a great honor to be part of this fantastic meeting of Bone and Tissue Days in Mexico. Uh, I also thank Paolo Prado for the introduction. And um, yeah, we will spend a lot of time uh, here uh, making a long journey into uh, the new possibilities in hard and soft tissue. And when we do this kind of webinars, this kind of uh, online lectures, I think uh, we must concentrate our attention in clinical possibilities, in clinical cases, because we don't have the same uh, interaction that we have with participants on a stage. So we must try to uh, speak uh, especially in a clinical point of view. Uh, little, little, uh, just a little few words about my city. Probably some of you know the David of Michelangelo that is in our city. Uh, it's a half million city uh, with a population of half, half a million. Population this is the cathedral that is still there after more than 700 years. Uh, I think at that time in Italy, we were able to uh, to build the things in the right way, uh, not like nowadays. And the city is very historical, it's a sort of museum. Uh, all the city is like a little museum. And you don't see face mask in this video because it's an old video, but now all the people is moving in the city with the face mask, unfortunately. Uh, this is the council building in the heart of the city. Probably some of you know about the Ponte Vecchio, the old bridge, we will see soon. And a lot of tourists, not in this period, unfortunately for our economy, uh, but it's a very uh, historical and touristic place, uh, not just for Italians, but I think from all over the world, people are coming probably many even from Lat Latin American. We have, for example, plenty of Brazilian tourists. And uh, it's a great pleasure for us to, uh, to receive all these people from all over the world. And we hope to see you again soon. OK, let's start our presentation. Uh, nowadays, we have some implant treatment goals for posterior and anterior sites. Of course, we have to uh, insert the implant in a 3D uh, implant position, prosthetically driven, uh, respecting the ideal position for the prosthesis. And we nowadays, we take care a lot about the soft tissue, so the volume of the soft tissue, the keratinization, and of course, finally, a natural appearance of the restoration. For anterior sites, we 
everything become a little more complex because we, of course, place the implant uh, in the posthetically driven position, but we have to take care much more about the frame of our tooth that is the soft tissue. So the soft tissue level, the soft tissue shape, the soft tissue color, keratinization, and of course, the best processes that we can. And in both condition, in uh, uh, healed side or in fresh socket side, we have to respect exactly the same principles. We have to respect the minimal quantity of bone that was uh, exactly clear from ITI principles. We have to respect the distance between implant and implant and between implant and natural teeth. We have mainly uh, to respect a sufficient amount of bone in the buccal plate to prevent uh, resorption, transparencies, lack of osteointegration. And finally, but not finally as important, the correct depth of the implant that is uh, a very well established measure for tissue level and bone level implants. As we want to respect all this principle, theoretically is very easy to do. But in a clinical point of view, as we try to maintain the implant in the three-dimensional position for the prosthesis, especially for a screw-retained prosthesis, very often we have to graft. So grafting became very, very common in my practice. And every year I increase the grafting treatments. And as more critical as we do fresh socket implants, for example, where we have to modify the implant position and we have to leave some spaces for intentional grafting uh, between the buccal plate and the implant. So grafting became dramatically important. I remember when I started to place implants in the half of the 90s, the main idea was looking for bone. Bone was our fixed idea, no? Uh, we wanted a lot of bone, good quality bone, uh, long implants, wide implants. Uh, we were only concentrated in bone, but now we are more concentrated in the correct implant position. Sometimes we prefer to decrease the dimensions of the implants, even because we can use better surfaces, better materials, and we can use in some application, narrow implants, short implants, but we don't want to make compromises with the prosthesis. And when we approach the grafting techniques, first of all, we have to establish the surgical goal. Secondary, we have to choose the correct uh, biomaterial, or we can use the autologous bone. We have to select one of the best techniques for grafting because we have many different techniques, but not all techniques are the same and not all techniques are the same in my hands because I am more experienced with some techniques. I feel more confident with some techniques. I don't feel so confident with other techniques. It depends also on my skill, on my experience, but even I think in the well-established technique in time. And finally, like always, to take care about the soft tissue. As we want to respect, as we want to establish a surgical goal, we want to uh, drive our implant in the ideal prosthetic position. When we talk about bone harvesting, we want to choose the ideal material. Uh, the correct technique, and what about the soft tissue we will see later. Let's analyze one by one these basic points. Uh, some people show me some x-rays and ask me, is there enough bone for an implant in this x-ray? And I think this is the wrong approach to implant dentistry. Probably it was correct in the half of the 90s, but nowadays... The correct approach is, is there enough bone to ensure our project? So, first of all, we have to establish our prosthetic goal. goal. 
sorry, let's see this case. We have this young patient, Patty, from Eastern Europe. Uh, she has a removable prosthesis, and when she take out this prosthesis, the situation is not the best. She wants to move to a fixed restoration. We analyze with models and pictures. We can see that this removable picture is not so bad as a starting point. Uh, we can use as a sort of walks up. Um, what we are doing now, we are not concentrating mainly in bone, but we take, for example, digital impression in the mouth of the patient, and we can make a digital impression of the removable prosthesis to match them together. Because, as I said before, it can be a sort of walks up in this case. And after a CBCT, we match the digital impression of the mouth of the patient with a CBCT. After that, we can match the walks up or the removable prosthesis. And we obtain at that moment everything that we need that is the amount of soft tissue, the amount of bone, and the ideal position for teeth. So what we do now is from the database of the software, co-diagnostics, we can try to select the diameter of the implant, the length of the implant, taking care about the bone, but not just on the bone. Let's, for example, see in this case, I go back just one moment. Yeah, okay. If you see in this image, I have not a sufficient amount of bone to place a 3.3 millimeter implant. Uh, so my temptation, if I don't have any project into the software, would be to follow the direction of bone, trying to keep my implant as more as possible into the bone but the bone is not sufficient anyway. And what I prefer to do is to respect the prosthetic plan and graft into the bone because I can do many things with bone, but I cannot do many things if my implant stay in the wrong position at the end because prosthesis can solve only minimally the problem that you create with the implant. So we go on and we decide this position. We want to use rock solid implants 3.3 for premolars, for lateral incisor. And you can see how simple it is to establish the uh, surgical goal when you start with these software. So mainly as we do such a sophisticated planning, it's a pity to waste this planning. We want to bring this planning into the surgery. So what we do very often nowadays to design a guide, a computer guide. Uh, I don't like very much to work closed flap. In this case, it was impossible because we wanted to graft intentionally. So we uh, drill the bone after uh, elevating a flap. And in this moment, I don't have to, to look because I trust in uh, guided surgery, especially when uh, is on natural teeth. Uh, so we insert the 3.3 millimeter implants. And after implant positioning, of course, we have fenestrations. Yeah, this, we planned to have this fenestration, but we uh, we are not stressed because everything was planned and we want to graft and obtain at the end the ideal axis for the prosthesis. So we mobilize the flap before using biomaterials and we can use some bovine bone, in this case mixed with autologous bone that was taken from the patient to obtain the correct protection for the threads of the implant and the correct volume 
for the final aesthetic. We don't want, want to have uh, concavities. We don't want to have transparencies. So we use uh, bone graft with bovine that give us the opportunity of long-standing volume in the anterior area and we will cover with a pericardium membrane that is ideal for these indications. We correct all the concavities. We want to prevent any problem of aesthetic and every hygienic problem. So after that, we can simply close the flap that was mobilized before the surgery. So after that we have a plan, <laughs> we uh, have to look for the ideal materials for grafting. And uh, the three basic rules when we talk about biomaterials is to look for vascularity because we all know that blood contains all the factors to obtain some bone. Uh, to look for some induction, especially as more your treatment is challenging, as more you need induction in your grafting material. For example, if I have just to uh, correct the volume, uh, probably I don't need so much induction, but if I want to make a vertical augmentation or if I have a very big defect, I have to look for some inductive factor. And we have to protect from mechanical factors. So even in this case, as more the case is challenging, as more we need a protection from mechanical stress on our grafting materials. And the treatment option factors depends on many factors, the geometry of the defect, the size of the defect, how the biomaterial work in terms of effectiveness, in terms of resorption. We have to control the infection risk. We have to establish if the de defect is critical or non-critical and if the area is aesthetic or not aesthetic. I will not talk about of all this point, but just telling you, for example, what do we mean when we say critical or non-critical? Uh, a defect, we can call it critical when the implant will stay mainly in regenerated bone. So we don't need just a volume, we need vital bone, we, we need something that is able to uh, receive an implant and to be attached to this implant. And uh, all these factors are very important. Now we will just concentrate on biomaterials. And uh, when we talk about biomaterials, some of them are what we call bone fillers. Uh, not autologous bone, and we have to consider the effectiveness of these biomaterials and the resorption of these biomaterials. What we know is that mainly the gold standard remain the autologous bone that is the only one who can give you an induction. The biomaterials that you can buy are normally the a sort of uh, frame, a sort of volume maintain, space maintaining uh, where the bone will grow. And if we see some papers, for example, uh, and you consider this paper who analyzed the new bone formation, you can see that autologous bone is the material who bring more new bone, around 41%, instead of uh, uh, other materials, like, for example, the bovine, that is the last one, that in this paper was BioOS, that only bring 24%, 25% of new bone formation. So if you just consider this kind of papers, you would exclude the bovine bone because you would probably look only for autologous bone. And this is not completely correct because you have to mix these results with these other results where if you see how much bone stay 
after regeneration. And only uh, 20, 18, 20% of autologous bone remains. So you obtain new bone formation, but you have some resorption. On the contrary, with bovine bone, you obtain not so much new bone formation, but you have a long-standing material that stay and keep the volume. So we don't have a good material or a bad material. We have some features, we have some characteristics, and we can use these characteristics uh, to achieve the ideal results for every kind of defects. And it's not so difficult to achieve uh, autologous bone. Uh, we can achieve, for example, from rotary drills, uh, where we, if you go slowly, and especially if you don't use saline solution, you can obtain a sufficiently good quantity of bone to mix with other biomaterials, for example. Or we can, uh, for example, obtain with a piezo surgery, we can obtain some bone chips. Uh, we do sometimes when we work on the sinus area we can sometimes collect some bone chips to mix with the biomaterials. Or we can use with the uh, uh, scalpel, for example. This is very good in anterior region, in nasal spine. We can achieve a very good quantity and a good quality of, of autologous bone that we will mix and place on the threads of the implant, in this case, covered by bovine bone in the most external area, like uh, Danny Boozer teach to all the world to do, to make a first layer of autologous bone directly on the threads of the implant and to cover with a sort of shield made with bovine bone. Or we can use uh, scrapers that are uh, very useful, especially in posterior mandible or some areas of the maxilla. But uh, very often we don't have enough autologous bone or we don't want just autologous bone because we want a more long-standing material. Uh, sometimes we used to mix and we can use, for example, cadaveral bone or we can use uh, bovine bone, or we can use synthetic materials. Uh, you will not see, in my cases, cases with human bone, uh, because in Italy we are not allowed to use. So most of my cases are made with autologous or bovine or synthetic. Uh, but the big differences are between the synthetic material and the bovine bone, because the bovine bone is uh, very difficult to resorb completely, and we prefer to use this biomaterial, especially when we want to obtain volume for a long time, a sort of shield. Sometimes I say to my students, a sort of stone, yeah, this is not very elegant as a term, but uh, it fixes in the mind of students what's the meaning of using a lot of bovine alone and not mix, for example, with autologous. On the contrary, when we talk about synthetic, is uh, normally a material who resorb naturally around three, six months and leave the space for uh, new bone formation. So if you want just to have volume, probably is not the first choice. But if you trust in a sort of very favorable regeneration of bone, like small defects or with many walls all around of autologous bone, you can even use the synthetic that is good for all the religions and all the, the kind of human being, because you know that every kind of biomaterial has some limitation on the base of ethic or religion of people. And my personal decisional tree is uh, to use autologous bone in all the indication, I could say, only if I want buckle plate maintenance of volume to use the autologous bone alone is a little limited. 
I use synthetic biomaterial, especially when it's easy to have bone healing. For example, uh, just to make a, an example, the sinus augmentation is a very favorable kind of defect because you have a five walls defect where you have all bone around and you have just to uh, have some time for a spontaneous regeneration. We can use for small defects and for uh, horizontal defects, especially mixed with other biomaterials. The bovine bone is, bone, is good for most of indication. Again, uh, I prefer to use bovine mix with autologous bone, or I can use even bovine alone when I just need volume. And what about the barriers? Barriers are very important in our uh, grafting techniques. We have a wide demonstration in literature that barriers are important. Membranes are important for lateral augmentation. We have better results. We have better results even in cases of reach uh, preservation cases. We will talk later about that. And one of the factors that became... Hi, Massimo. Uh, see? Can you yeah. hear me? <clears throat> we already have a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the biomaterials you were talking about. So you were talking about uh, Cerebon, the bovine, uh, Maxisorb synthetic, and allograft in general. So there's a couple of questions. One is, uh, in generally speaking, uh, if you mix the uh, bovine bone with autologous, and if you when and the percentage does it affect the uh, oh. clinic outcome? Yeah, um, generally, is more the the defect is challenging. Is more the percentage has to be around fifty percent and fifty percent. For example, when you make a vertical augmentation in bone, that is probably the most challenging application. The recommendation of, um, of the authors, of all the, the clinician, is to uh, be around 50 and 50 percent. Uh, as more you, you have less uh, challenging defect, more predictable defect, like the uh, horizontal augmentation in a non-critical defect, uh, where the implant will stay not all in regenerated bone, I think we are not so strict in this percentage. I could probably follow the, the boozer instruction to make a first layer of autologous bone just to cover the screws and an external layer of, uh, of uh, bovine. Perfect. Thank you. And... Um... Just uh, commenting on this, uh, what, would, what is the role then, the autologous bone, when we are using a bovine bone? Why do we mix it? Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the main idea, the main principle is to have some induction because uh, as you use just bovine bone, you have the blood that is... Uh, filling all the empty space between the particles. So basically, you can have regeneration even with just bovine bone. Uh, bovine bone is a fantastic material, is I think the number one biomaterial in dentistry. Uh, but uh, when you use autologous bone, you have a sort of booster for your regeneration because uh, it releases a lot, a lot of growth factor, and there are many papers who demonstrate that the particles of autologous bone are like the new center for uh, new bone formation. So, uh, autologous bone is inductive, uh, bovine bone is conductive. Hmm? Perfect. <clears throat> and um, since we are talking about mixing, you also mentioned the possibility of using uh, autologous bone and, and uh, bovine bone in a layer technique. What is then the advantage of using first autologous around the implant? Yeah, and uh, because bovine bone is protected. Uh, we want 
we do all that because we want a safe OS integration of the implant and probably to have an initial layer of, of autologous bone brings to a very natural OS integration of the implant. So you have on the direct contact with the surface of the implant, the highest level of induction. Uh, in the external side, you have the advantage to have more stable material like the bovine bone. So the double layer technique is very, very old and very predictable and we all love it because we have both the advantages uh, using this kind of, uh, of two layers in the regeneration. Massimo, we also have another question, this one regarding uh, the synthetic biomaterials. Obviously, um, there's many in the market, so people have had slightly different experiences, depending also on what uh, they used. And in this particular case, the doctor said, I've used a, a synthetic bone in the past and it never reabsorbed. Is this the one that you're using different yeah. as the remodel? This is a very good question because I used the wrong term to, to say uh, synthetic, no? Like if synthetic, it means everything. And it was my fault because uh, there are many different things that are synthetic. For example, if you use uh, hydroxylapatite, this never resorb. So it's okay, synthetic, it's good for all the religion, all the ethical problems, but it's there's nev never resorb. Uh, when I mean synthetic, especially using botis, uh, I mean uh, a calcium phos uh, phosphate uh, with hydroxylapatite who uh, obtain a very good and natural uh, resorption into the bone. So uh, it's very important the kind of biomaterial when we talk about synthetic because we have, for example, in the market, not just hydroxylapatite, but we have bioglass, uh, we have just calcium phosphate, we have just hydroxylapatite, uh, we have a um, lot, a lot of different things with different uh, resorption. So I'm sorry, I, I have to talk about only uh, this combination of calcium phosphate and hydroxylapatite that is the Botis biomaterial that I mainly use. Um, just to comment on that, and then uh, for the moment there are no more questions. One uh, crucial aspect of a synthetic biomaterial that the listeners can look for, apart from the brand, so generally speaking, is the way that the particle, the macro particle looks like. Uh, yeah. The one that Massimo showed really looks like human bone, and this is the secret. It looks like human bone, and then it tends to behave like human bone. Like uh, if you see, yeah, the one on the right, he has a very similar resemblance to human bone. And this gives a uh, behavior that has, it is like human bone. So um, this was the comment. So Massimo, for the moment, there are no further questions. So please continue. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Arturo. Uh, I go now back to the slide when we talk about barriers. And uh, let's see, for example, one uh, case of my office, the patient came with this situation, three old implants, many placed many, many years ago, but you can see the situation now with the infection, fractures, and we have even uh, a natural tooth that was compromised by the, that implant that is in the same position of the root, so everything was moving. And, of course, I decided to take out uh, all the, the implants and the natural tooth. And I didn't feel comfortable to place immediately implants in this situation, even because there was a, a very irregular defects into the bone. And the, the situation of the soft tissue was not ideal for placing immediately the implant. So uh, in these cases, I try first to take care about the heart tissue. So 
I used bovine bone in this case because I wanted to have uh, a stability of, of the bone in this region and cover everything with a, uh, with a pericardium membrane that is very, very stable for three, six months. So we can keep the volume. And as I want to uh, be more sure about the position, about the stability of the membrane, I do very often this stabilization with titanium pins that looks a little more difficult, but in reality, uh, it's easier to manipulate uh, these biomaterials, this membrane using, for example, just two pins. We don't need 10 pins. We need sometimes only two pins to have the stability of a membrane. We can reflect the membrane on the lingual side without using other pins on the lingual side because uh, it will be sufficiently stable under the periosteal tissue uh, because it's not possible to move the membrane in the uh, vestibular side. This was the primary closure that is mandatory in all our treatments. Um, in every kind of technique you will use, uh, you have to look for a primary closure. Uh, this is the healing at six months. That is the minimum time that we wait for bone regeneration. At the moment of uh, uncovering, I placed two uh, implants and I wanted to obtain more volume for the soft tissue. So you see two slices of uh, porcine dermis matrix who bring more protection and more volume for the soft tissue. And in this case, you can see the primary closure is not mandatory because we can protect with uh, the dermis matrix that is very, very resistant to uh, hydrolysis into the mouth of the patient. Uh, we try to not to expose too much this biomaterial, but we, if we expose like one millimeter or even a little more, we have not big problems. You will see that healing and then the prosthetic final workflow with zirconia bridge. And the difference is you can see the stability of bone. Uh, we had some vertical component in the defect. And in these cases, I prefer to use bovine to prevent resorption of that vertical uh, component of the defect. Uh, when we have to select the grafting technique, I suggest to you this very, very simple classification that we find in ITI treatment guide. Uh, it's not one of the most common classification, but in my opinion, it's very easy to remember and very, very uh, easy to do. Uh, we uh, divide in four parts the alveolar bone and we can have the type when we lose one fourth or two fourth or three fourth or just a Massimo, point. sorry to interrupt you. Um, yeah. There's a question regarding the previous clinical case. Um, yeah. There's a delay of uh, 30 seconds. That's why I interrupted you. Uh, regarding okay. the previous case, um, they were asking um, if they can uh, leave mucoderm exposed again. Uh, and if yes, how would you decide the amount of mucoderm exposed? This is a, one of the most difficult questions to answer. Uh, I will talk very much about mucoderm later. So um, just to spend two words, but we will treat more widely this, this uh, issue later. I can say that I try to expose less much as possible this biomaterial because the resorption is very unpredictable. Uh, if you ask me, there's a risk of infection, I say no. Uh, I use a lot of mucoderm and infection is not a very common risk for this material. I would say it's very difficult to get infected, but you have a non-predictable resorption of the material. So this is the reason why I try not to expose very much this biomaterial. But if I have like 
five millimeters under the flap and one millimeter exposed, in my opinion, this is quite predictable as a good application. Uh, I can say the percentage could be like uh, one to three, uh, one millimeter exposed and three millimeters below. But uh, this is only a clinical point of view, is not something that with evidence based, only clinically based. But I would spend more words about mucoderm later if you if you are, uh, if, if we arrive at that part of the presentation. Thank you, Massimo. Uh, thank you, Arturo. And uh, this classification is for a single tooth gap or for extended dental space or for a completely dental jaw. And every uh, possibility, like in all ITI publication that ITI, you all know, is fantastic idea to keep simple all the things, to be clear for clinicians, not to make tricks. And we have, for example, for single tooth, all the uh, preferred technique or alternative techniques. Uh, for dental spaces, the same. Let's see uh, some clinical example. For single missing teeth, when we have just uh, the, the most crystal part that is missing, so the uh, ideal situation for regeneration or one of the easiest uh, cases for regeneration, the preferred technique is GPR and implant placement in a single intervention. And we have an alternative technique that is to stage the GBR and not to do together with the implant. And how would you choose one or the other one of these techniques? We will see, for example, when we work in anterior cases and when the case is more demanding for aesthetics, sometimes we prefer to stage because we don't want to have uh, a minimum risk of failure. So you have a double choice for these techniques and uh, we can choose if we feel uh, if we feel confident with our experience with our skill with the kind of patient with the kind of site non aesthetic area to do all in one session we can do it but in some other cases probably we are not so experienced or we don't trust so much on this patient, or the patient is very demanding, we prefer not to look for a miracle, too many miracles at the same time. We prefer to gain bone and then to place the implant in the ideal situation or even to correct an initial failure at the moment of implant insertion. Let's see, for example, we are not in anterior region. We have just a small defect. You can see I like very much tissue level implants in posterior area. And what I want to obtain is just volume. I'm not stressed about also integration of this implant. I have more integration that I need, but I don't want to have this exposure of the surface of the implant. I don't want to have concavity. I don't like the quality of the soft tissue, so I can decide to do something very simple like bovine bone uh, to obtain volume and uh, soft tissue grafting with porcine dermis matrix uh, in the external side and uh, this kind of healing with a healing abutment. You can see in a very single way, I obtain a convexity, a big convexity instead of a concavity. You can see how we started and how we finished after the healing. Uh, it's very, very uh, favorable for, for start the processes. As my defect is more deep, but it's still just horizontal, I don't have a vertical uh, part of the defect. The ITI treatment guide text tell me that staged is more safe. Hmm? As more the case is difficult, as more better to stage. Uh, in alternative, we can make a simultaneous 
uh, implant placement with the GBR. Let's see, for example, this case. This tooth is failing. I think nobody have doubts about that. And at the moment of reopening, you see that we have no bone at all in the horizontal side. We have the height of bone, but we don't have uh, a good thickness in bone. Uh, the patient is not very much interested in aesthetic. Uh, the situation, in my opinion, is quite uh, predictable. So I want just to keep my implant inside the defect, prosthetically driven, but using not a wide implant, using a narrow implant, like a 3.3 millimeter. I keep the implant inside the defect to minimize the, the risk of uh, problems and I graft with bovine bone. Again, I can use uh, a resorbable membrane with two pins to be sure about the stability of these regeneration materials, not to have squeezing of the biomaterial around, not to have mobility of the membrane during the closure of the flap. Uh, in case of multiple teeth, not single teeth, as we have uh, a, an initial defect like that one. Uh, again, we have the indication for staged or we have the indication for simultaneous implant placement. Uh, we see, for example, this defect in the mandible. We do a CBCT and we observe that we have the possibility to place implants prosthetically driven uh, just exposing a little part of the implant, not very much. So the day of the surgery, I elevate a full thickness flap. Of course, we place two 3.3 millimeter implants and we have the possibility to make some holes into the bone to have more vascularity. And in this case, I wanted also to improve the- Massimo, sorry. Yeah. We have another couple of questions. Uh, uh, again, um, referring to the previous uh, slides. So um, you were referring to one, two-stage uh, surgeries approaches, and um, one of the question is uh, referring to, let's say, when you would do in a immediate implant placement. When would you do the uh, mm, soft tissue management? In which moment? At the beginning? No. At the end? I and then, sorry, uh, uh, to sorry. add to this question, what do you do with the healing cap and the connection? Uh, is this a problem for to use a matrix or a autologous tissue? How do you do it? Which case? This one? It was uh, the previous one, I think. This one? Yeah, I think it was this one, yeah. Yeah. So I, you, I like... Uh, I, I like very much to use heel abutment. Every time I have a good stability for the implant and I have no removable prosthesis, I prefer to guide immediately the soft tissue in position, even because if I submerge this implant, I have to wait around six months because I placed biomaterials. Uh, as my biomaterial remain untouched later I, I, I can just wait two months for os integration and I can start to do the prosthesis because my biomaterials stay untouched. I don't expose again the biomaterials. Every time I use biomaterials, if I have to uncover, I have to wait a longer time because I don't want to disturb the regeneration process. I don't want to disturb the soft tissue that is healing. So it takes a long time, around six months. Sometimes it's good even to wait, but if I, have, if I can wait less, I prefer to wait less for my patient. So when I have um, all my implants inside, I have no risk, uh, no other kind of risk. I prefer to use uh, uh, healing abutment. In this other case, for example, I don't feel 
free to use a healing abutment because my regeneration is quite critical. So I need to wait six months. So as I need to, to wait six months, has no sense to risk with a healing abutment. It's better to cover everything to obtain a good regeneration, a good stability, do not disturb the process and uncover after six months. The case is not yet finished, but this was just to show the technique. Thank you, Massimo. Thank you. So in this case that we were seeing, um, I want to take care about the bone and I want to take care about the soft tissue. And you can see I used the dermis matrix as a membrane with two titanium pins. I, I know that this technique is not yet completely uh, evidence-based, but uh, as you know, this uh, matrix, it stay around six months. So I feel free to use as a, as a membrane, even if it's not properly a membrane. Uh, what I like of this is technique is the shape that I obtain with using this material because I have a very big elastic memory of the biomaterial. So you see how stiff is the biomaterial at the beginning. I have to bend it and fix with the pin and you see one angle of the, the the matrix that is coming out and I can fix with a second pin and obtain this rounded shape that is, in my opinion, is very favorable. And the question you did before about when I take care about the soft tissue, normally I take care about the soft tissue at the moment of uncovering. So if I decide to uncover the implant, the moment for soft tissue grafting is at the moment of uncovering for me. And you can see I took, for other reason, a CBCT after six months, and you can see how the shape, the rounded shape of mucoderm uh, gave me this fantastic rounded shape of the bone. So normally I say that the, um, the membrane take the shape of the biomaterial. When you use mucoderm, is the biomaterial who assume the shape of the membrane. This is something that I like quite a lot. At the moment of uncovering, I use connective tissue graft from the pellet. Uh, this was the situation at the moment of uncovering. You see the quality of the soft tissue is not good because when you use mucoderm, you don't have to look for keratinization. Mucoderm is one of my favorite biomaterials, probably my favorite biomaterial, but I cannot ask this biomaterial to to be inductive for uh, uh, keratinization. I want to obtain volume with this biomaterial. I want to, to, to obtain protection, but as I want keratinization, I need something from the pellet or from the tuberosity of the patient. So you see how uh, using all these devices with two interventions, we, we receive, we we achieve at the end a sufficient amount of hard tissue and soft tissue for two retained crowns. And this is after three years, the control. Massimo. Yeah. Uh, regarding this case, we have two questions. Um, uh, 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 I'm when, sure. was... I, think, uh, I think we have to select a little because uh, we have many slides. Uh, I don't know if There's we... Too many? We have many slides. I don't know if we want to stay uh, until tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> we have to okay. select. Okay, we can no. select a little bit less. Let, let's try to... to uh, we can probably even um, select one or the most important question that you consider or... I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> All right. No, no, no. I mean, uh, we will select the uh, more a little bit more. I will ask you this too, and then um, uh, yeah. we'll continue. Yeah. So, regarding the case with uh, the others for later, if we have time, we we will answer to all the all questions. All right. Let's do that. 
So uh, shall, we, shall I ask you this too, or shall we? Yeah, 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 of course. All right. So regarding the case with mucoderm and the pins, uh, there were uh, basically two questions. Uh, how long will you hydrate mucoderm to achieve that um, flexibility that is clear in the pictures? And if you use mucoderm in a situation like this, do I need to use a, a membrane? In other words, does mucoderm have a barrier effect? No, I think uh, mucoderm is, is enough as a barrier. Uh, if you use, uh, for example, a JSON membrane and the mucoderm on top, uh, probably it can be a little risky for the vascularization of all these materials, all, all these barriers. I think uh, in this case, we could use JSON membrane, for example, excluding mucoderm, or we can use mucoderm. This case I like because it um, give you show you the opportunity to guide with uh, this uh, barrier the shape of the biomaterial. And as you know, Arturo is a technique that I do very often because. Uh, in my experience, this biomaterial is a fantastic membrane. I know that it's a bit out of the indications, uh, even if it's published, uh, the, this application of mucoderm, but uh, I think that we have a lot of advantages. Another advantage using this device is that if I have a little exposure of the flap, a little uh, a reopening just a little of the flap, it's less uh, risky. Anyway, the time of rehydration is around 20 minutes, 15 minutes, but uh, I did many cases just using uh, three, four, five minutes. So the ideal condition is around 15, 20 minutes, but it's not uh, mandatory to wait so much, we can even start a little before. Thank you, Massimo. Thank you. So we proceed with this case that was already finished. We have the control in time as we started and as we finished with a very simple technique. Uh, what is more demanding is when you have a more critical defect, like in this case I will show you, is the same patient that re she received a kick from a horse when she was a very young uh, girl. And the situation here is very, very challenging, as you can see, because she's very young. Uh, the area is a main aesthetic area. We have a critical defect because we have a lack of volume. It's not a single span, but it's uh, a, an extended dental space. Three teeth are missing. We have a concavity instead of a convexity. So the case, in my opinion, was quite challenging. And this was the shape of the crest in the CBCT. You can see there is nothing. I could say we have no way to split the crest because it's only cortical. Is The height is good, and this is the, the good news, but we have no thickness. So we cannot split. Uh, we cannot do many things in this case. And I was very stressed about this case, so I also used a 3D printed model to analyze the quantity of bone that I, that I would need. And what I decided to do in this case is to go back to a very old technique that in my hands is still one of the best techniques for regeneration, to take an autologous bone block from the ramus and to place uh in the area in the in the receiving area this is the situation after six months we have a good amount of hard tissue but as you can see the situation of the soft tissue is not good uh is very bad for the soft tissue um and at the moment of uncovering of the bone block I decided to place two implants, two narrow implants, excluding the lateral incisor, because this patient is very young, and I can imagine that in time,
probably I would change something, probably because of the shape or because of the color of the processes. So I want to stay far from the most aesthetic region. So I placed the two implants and a connective tissue graft again, because I don't need just volume of soft tissue. I need uh, new keratinization. I need proliferation, something that I cannot buy. I, I can just take from the patient. And this is what uh, we obtain using temporaries, uh, removing the temporaries every week, remodeling the temporary to guide the soft tissue to take this shape, uh, to press the soft tissue, to uh, uh, gain some volume more, some papillas, even if the case is not ideal, is a compromised case in my opinion, but uh, the this was the moment of the delivery of the bridge, and this is after one year, and the patient is quite happy, even because she uh, doesn't expose very much the soft tissue and at that distance looks very natural. And this is after three years. If you look exactly at the papillas, of course, we could not obtain 100%. I asked the patient to do another connective tissue graft, but she... Uh, was satisfied like this, she didn't want to, to have new intervention. Uh, we have also more extended uh, cases, like in this case that was very, very with a severe atrophy, as you can see with the co-diagnostics uh, examination. Again, we, we took a, a digital impression of the processes, and we, uh, we wanted to see if we have enough bone or how much bone we have to regenerate to place the implants prosthetically driven with such an atrophy. And in this case, we see that we have no bone in anterior side and no bone in posterior side. Well, so what it was possible, of course, was to move into zygoma implants Probably the main indication in this case was zygoma implant, but the patient uh, didn't want to have an narcosis, uh, was a bit stressed about zygoma, receives very bad information about that, and she was asking me just to use uh, more um, in-office techniques, uh, not to, to do it uh, with big, big surgeries. In reality, this is a quite big surgery. You see we have fenestration in all the areas and we have to graft into the sinus both sides. So what I decided to do in this case was to um, use eight implants for uh, have enough implants in case of failures of one or two of these implants when we have such challenging cases, we have also to consider failures. Uh, and this was my planning to use eight implants for the processes and one single implant in the medial line for stabilization of a removable processes. Uh, the day of the surgery, uh, I decided to open a big flap, do a double sinus lift, taking some bone from uh, the windows and some bone from the nasal spine to mix with uh, bovine bone. Uh, was used this titanium mesh, customized titanium mesh to, uh, to keep all the bone inside and protect with collagen membranes all around. This was the uh, healing and you can see this ectopic implant in the medial line. It looks weird, I know. is a four millimeter tissue level implant that stay exactly in the center uh, because this kind of cases, we cannot use any removable processes for uh, basically uh, three, four, uh, uh, sorry, six uh, or more weeks. 
and this is was after four months and the prosthesis was attached only with a uh, with an attachment in the center of the pellet on these four millimeter tissue level implants and after six months we removed that implant that was failing uh, this was the CBCT that was taken after six months where we see before the uncovering that uh, we achieved a good amount of bone both into the sinus and into the crystal area and this was the uncovering placing the healing abutment uh, this was how we started and what we got at the end and the trying stages and the final uh, this was still with the temporary and the final prosthesis screw retain that was uh, screw in the mouth of the patient uh, what is more nice is my opinion is to see how much bone we could obtain uh, using this mix of techniques sinus augmentation and titanium mesh to obtain more volume one of the most typical application of biomaterials in implant dentistry is for sinus lift procedures and uh, uh, we cannot elevate the sinus all the time that we have an atrophy because depending on the residual anatomy we have some good indication for sinus lift and some bad indication for example when we have a crystal atrophy that is more important than the pneumatization of the sinus in this case we have a contraindication in sinus lift so the main indication is when we have a, a, an increase in the geometry of the shape of the sinus and not a big atrophy in the alveolar crest uh, anyway it's a very predictable technique i think is one of the oldest regeneration techniques that we have in our hands is very predictable and is very uh, easy to get bone into the sinus when the technique is correct we see for example a very typical case when we want to use a tissue level implant for a molar we have residual bone around two two millimeters of bone and in this case the lateral uh, wall was very thick so uh, this was just the end when i want to uh, remove that bone to open a window because it's too thick this bone so i used the piezo surgery we i decided to remove that bone to have a best better control of the membrane of the schneiderian membrane and at that point i can abandon the piezo surgery or the rotative instruments and use just the manual curettes to elevate the sinus the technique is very old and nobody in italy are interested to to <laughs> to know to receive information about sinus lift because most of clinicians who do implants they are able to do sinus or some are not interested in sinus and send the patient to me or to other clinicians uh, after elevation of the schneider and membrane sometimes i like to use this kind of biomaterial is a collagen sponge uh, we call jason fleece it's a very uh, fast resorption material that helped me to keep the membrane up during drilling so i use it just to obtain a new uh, a new floor a new sinus floor that is very high so i can drill without big uh, tension or uh, uh, i can protect the membrane keep 
After that, we can use a mixture, for example, of synthetic biomaterial and bovine, or even just synthetic. My first choice in sinus augmentation is Max Resorb, because I don't, I don't need a very long-standing biomaterial. I prefer to use a more uh, easy to resorb biomaterial, especially when I do it in combination with implant insertion. So every time I place the implant, I don't need a very long-standing biomaterial. We first insert the biomaterial in the more mesial area. Then we insert the implant and we complete the filling after implant insertion uh, with a more stable implant. As more I go on the on the window area, as more I can use a bovine material because I will obtain a shield in the more external area. And after that, we can protect with the membrane. In this case, I use some antibiotic. This is, I think, nothing uh, scientific. Is only something for control the stress of the dentist, not to uh, improve the quality of the surgery. And we complete with a resorbable membrane to protect the area. In this case was cold protect membrane, but Jason membrane would, would work even uh, in the same way. Another sinus lift, this is the planning to take out a molar, to insert two implants after the healing uh, of the extractions. Uh, here, the sinus lateral wall is not so thick, so we proceed uh, with a normal technique of uh, remove the bone, check the mobility of the window, And we can go on keeping the piezo surgery instrument uh, parallel to the bone to avoid that the instrument that this rounded ball goes inside. Very often I try to remove the, 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 that uh, wall that is moving, but in this case I can even reflect inside. And we do an initial elevation with this, with this smooth instrument, and then we continue manually the elevation. I go a little faster. We do an initial filling, like before, with a synthetic Max Resorb. We do the first layer more mesial and more anteriorly. And then when it's ready, we can place the implant if we are sure to get enough stability. When I do implant insertion, sometimes I like to protect the membrane from the apex of the implant, especially when we use more aggressive threads. So I like to use this curette, this very smooth and big curette on top of the apex of the implant. So I can more easily uh, distribute the pressure on the surrounded materials. You see this case, this was the initial situation before extraction at the moment of implant insertions. This was the post sinus lift image. And this was the final result with a three unit bridge. In this case, in this case I took uh, in the uh, mesial area a, a sample and we, we have seen a good reformation of bone. Another case that show you something that can occur during the surgery, uh, it's not very uncommon because normally we show all the cases that are perfect, but in this case, we had a little complication. You, you see we have a little, uh, a little, uh, 
little uh, incision into the membrane so we cannot start placing the biomaterial without taking care because we can have uh, an accidental uh, insertion of the biomaterial into the sinus so we want to prevent this uh, risky situation so after the elevation of the sinus I need to protect this little incision into the sinus mucosa. So what I decided to do is to use uh, a pericardium membrane, Jason membrane. You see, I insert inside. I need a big one because I want to keep one part outside because as I will put biomaterial inside, I have to be sure to have the membrane in place without any displacement of the membrane. You see now it's covered, we have breathing of the patient, patient is alive, this is the main important thing. And we can proceed now with a normal feeling with, uh, again, the synthetic max resorb material. Mm -hmm. And after that, we will insert the implants, everything is under control and we want also to graft on this apex of this implant that was ex accidentally exposed we have no perimplantitis in this case the implant was an old implant that when i elevated the flap i found these threads exposed so again in this case i don't use an, a, a synthetic material i use a bovine material because i want to have a very long standing uh, material for maintaining the volume and a JSON membrane. Uh, in another case, more challenging, I combined the sinus leaf with the regeneration. We have this failure of this very weird solution with a single implant with a cantilever. This was, I think, a crazy solution. Uh, we have a very big defect in bone. So what I wanted to do to make a a vertical augmentation in that area and the sinus lift in the posterior area to place two implants instead of a single one. So sinus lift, uh, I used again uh, mucoderm as a membrane. You see we have a little exposure of mucoderm in the area of the extraction of the implant. There was two uh, BLX implants in place. One implant was used for immediate restoration for aesthetic reason and the sinus lift implant of course we left for many months before loading and finally this is the uh, final restoration. You see how we started and how we finished in these two x-rays and the bovine bone was very very effective to maintain the crystal height of the uh, of the area of atrophy for the implant failure